We are going to continue in God's study of his word, and we're so grateful that we are together today. We are continuing on in a sermon series through the amazing book of Genesis. If you are with us for the first time today, you will pick up where we are as we travel on in this great study. Today we are in Genesis chapter 9. Take that Bible, open with me. Uh, If you don't have a Bible with you, there are pew Bibles in place. We'd love for you to open it with me. As we get underway, there's a very simple outline of the 50 chapters of the book of Genesis. We look at a long book like that and think, boy, that is so involved. But actually, there are only two points in the book of Genesis that we cover. We are looking at, number one, chapters 1 through 11, the beginnings of humanity. And then in chapters 12 through 50, we look at the beginnings of God's nation, Israel. That's the two-point outline of the book of Genesis. We're looking at the beginning of humanity and the beginning of the nation of Israel. As we look at the beginnings of humanity, we cover the creation of Adam and Eve, their fall into sin, the great flood of God's judgment, and also the Tower of Babel. When we get to the section that will cover the beginnings of the nation of Israel, we look at two, at, uh, rather four great men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So right now, we're still in that first section as we get to chapter 9. As we open to chapter 9, we're arriving here, we realize we're still in the midst of the great flood narrative and what happens with Noah and his family and the flood. Now, before I move into that, let me cover something that many, many of you have asked me a question about. In this time of humanity's history, why is it that people lived so long? And so many people said, was the calendar different? Was there something different that we see people living over 900 years? Why did they live so long? Well, if you study that, you will find that some say that because of the new atmosphere, because of the new earth, because of uh, the, the plant life that was developing here, that lives were just long in that day because of the earthly conditions. And I think that's part of it. But I also believe this. Tie in with me here. When God created Adam and Eve, he created them to live eternally. If they had never sinned, they would have never died. And so I believe that Adam and Eve and their successive generations after them had amazingly strong bodies. They were to live for eternity in a sinless condition. However, they sinned. God gives them punishment. He says, now you will surely die. However, their bodies were still very, very strong, and they passed those genes down through the next generations so that people lived an extraordinarily long life, as we understand it, 900 uh, 900 years or more. They had these amazing bodies, and as we see Noah, he is only 10 generations removed from Adam. So he, too, has this amazing, strong character about him, and as time and sin and earthly conditions continue, lifespans get shorter. Now, you know that Moses wrote this historical account of the beginnings of humanity and the beginnings of Israel. He is the one that wrote the account of these men and women living 900 years and more. However, he also wrote a prayer. Moses wrote a prayer that is contained in your Bible, the book of Psalms, chapter 90. You don't have to turn there, but you might want to make a note of that. Moses wrote a prayer. He wrote this prayer about 1400 B.C. when he was living. And in this prayer, in Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, he says this, The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years. So he writes a historical account of people who were living 900 plus years, but in his day, a long, strong, productive life was 70 to 80 years. And so he wrote that about 3,500 years ago, and that's still pretty much the standard of today. 70 to 80 years is a long, strong life. Anyone who lives past 80 years has an amazing life, and there are a couple of you here today having an amazing, long life. We're grateful for that. But in the early stages of humanity, 900 years was relatively common. Noah was 500 years old. When God called him to build an ark, he was a righteous man with a righteous family, and God 
commissioned him to build an ark. He was to put his eight-member family on that ark along with pairs of animals, and they were going to preserve life as we know it as God sends this worldwide catastrophic flood to wipe out all sinners and all sin and all unrepentance and all wickedness, a righteous family and pairs of animals ride out that flood in this ark. So when the flood subsides, humanity and the animal kingdom can go on. And so as we think of that, chapter 9 of Genesis opens, and the flood is over, the ark is in its place, and Noah's family has come off of it. So with that, let's look at Genesis chapter 9. We'll begin with verses 1 through 7. Keep your Bible open. This is not where we stop. But hear these words from God's word. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea, and your hand, into your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb I have given you all things. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require... At the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Listen to verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you, be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. May God add his blessing to this beginning section of God's holy word in Genesis chapter 9. As we look at these verses, Noah and his family are coming off of the ark now, and God gives them a commission, and he repeats it twice in these verses that I read to you. Verse 1, verse 7, God says, Now, Noah and family, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth with righteousness, with righteous families. And what we see are Noah's three sons. The three sons' names are Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And every one of those sons develops a family, develops a lineage. Three separate families, three separate lineages by Shem and Ham and Japheth. Now, next week, we are going to study those three lineages of those three young men who are the sons of Noah. And I will tell you this much. It's extremely important that you hear this. In one of those sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, one of those sons develops a family lineage through which Abraham is born, and on down the line in Abraham's family comes Jesus the Christ. Now, if you want to do a little research and find out which one of those three sons is the patriarch of Jesus' family, you do that this week. That's your homework assignment. I'm not going to tell you. You look that up, figure that out, and we will talk about it next week. But that is extremely important that we see God speaking to Noah here in chapter 9. And here's what I want you to notice as we go on in this scripture. God gives Noah's family, at this point of coming off the ark, a new food source. Meat. Adam and Eve did not eat meat in their sinless state. They were given plants, fruits, but not meat. The animal kingdom was all at peace. However, when Noah and his family come off of the ark, God says, not only do I give you plants and fruits to eat, but also God makes Noah and his family hunters. Some of you here will be glad to hear that. But they could kill and they could eat animals as they came off of the ark. Now, don't miss this. God gives them a warning about this new section of their diet. I want you to look at verses 3 and 4 again. Genesis chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now, verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Noah's family could eat meat, but they could not keep the blood in the meat. Blood represents life, 
and life has to be respected. Even in the life of an animal, God says here, we respect the life of that animal by not eating the blood thereof. The blood has to be drained out of the animal. Now, that sounds like something that was so many years ago that it doesn't matter anymore. However, it's very important. In fact, we find a, an essential link from the Old Testament to the New Testament in what God says to Noah here about eating animals and the blood thereof. Blood in the Bible is life. The presence of blood is the presence of life. Why is there a connection with the Old Testament to the New? Because when Jesus died on the cross... We see in the gospel accounts of the many ways that his blood ran from him. It ran from him when they whipped him mercilessly on his back and his buttocks and his legs. It ran from him when they pushed that crown of thorns into his forehead. It ran from him when they nailed him with spikes to the cross. And as Jesus' blood flowed away, the Bible is teaching us that his life was laid down. Tom, you and I were on the same wavelength this week by God's direction. Did you notice today the songs that we sang had to do with the blood of Christ? Blood ran red, sin washed white. The blood of the Bible signifies and points to what Jesus did for us on the cross. Even in these words of prohibition to Noah, it points forward to what Jesus is going to do on the cross. His blood is going to run from him. His life is going to be coming from him so that we could be forgiven of sin. Jesus shed his blood. God allowed his son to die on the old rugged cross that you and I might be forgiven, that we might be saved, that we might have life everlasting. Here's a scripture reference. Don't lose it. Write it down. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin the Bible says that in order for you and me to be forgiven we depend on the shed blood of Jesus Christ because in the blood there is life the shedding of blood points us to life everlasting isn't that an amazing connection in God's word without Jesus death we could not be forgiven. There would be no hope of heaven. The blood ran red for our sin to be washed white. Now, as we go on in Genesis chapter 9, God tells Noah that human life is absolutely sacred. Human life is made in the image of God, therefore it is sacred. Life is to be protected. And especially today in our society, we need to take a stand that life is to be protected, especially protected in the womb. Our life is not protected in the, room, in, in the womb in our society. And you and I as a church need to stand up for that kind of protection to come to our babies. Now, of course, up to this point in human history, protecting life was not done so well. Cain killed Abel. Uh, Cain's great-great-great-grandson, Lamech, says in Genesis chapter 4, I killed a young man. And then just before the flood in Genesis chapter 6, Scripture tells us that before God's flood of judgment, the earth was filled with violence. Another interpretation of that word violence in Hebrew is murder. The world was filled with murder. People were not respecting human life. And God wiped them away because of that lack of respect of human life. America is being set up to be wiped away. God has not changed. His character has not changed. His righteousness has not changed. If he did it then, he can do it now. Somebody has to stand up, ladies and gentlemen, and we are those people to stand up for human life because it is to be protected. Noah's family comes off the ark in Genesis chapter 9. He establishes here a truth that is never to be retracted or rescinded or changed. Here is the truth of God as we saw it in Genesis chapter 9 as we hear it right here. God says, those who shed human blood in intentional murder shall also have their blood shed in punishment. You see that as the word of God? That's exactly what he tells Noah as they come off of the boat. God says, I am instituting capital punishment. How is that justice to be carried out? Not by individuals. 
If someone does something to your family, takes a life within your family, you do not have the right to go and murder that person. Justice is carried out by government, not by individuals, but by the government of people. Romans chapter 13, verse 4, Paul says that a ruler is a minister of God, and he bears the sword of punishment. The ruler has capital punishment in his hands as the government's representative. However, in our society, just this past week, I saw an article in Time magazine that said the death penalty in the United States is now dead. We're wiping it off the books. It's not going to happen anymore. As a deterrent of crime, we're not going to have the death penalty anymore. Now, while that sounds wonderful to many of us, According to this word of God, it's a step away from the word. It's a step away from what God institutes as righteous, institutes as being in the hands of government. Do you know since creation, since the creation of Adam and Eve, God has established only three institutions on this earth, only three. Number one, marriage. Number two, government. Number three, the church. Those are the only three institutions since Adam and Eve that God has brought about on this earth. Let's think about those three. Marriage. Marriage between a man and a woman. Marriage, a holy commitment. We saw that holy commitment in this sanctuary yesterday. However, our society has now watered down what that commitment is in biblical terms. Now, our society is saying, well, anybody can get married. Two men, two women, it doesn't matter. An absolute step away from God's holy word. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Our society is watering it down. One institution watered down. Think about the institution of government. At this point in our society, our government is walking away from God. Prayer is never allowed in a courtroom. God's word is never allowed in making our laws. We're seeing now that our government more and more is putting weight to human wisdom, human discernment. And basically what I'm saying to you right now, as our government redefines marriage, as our government redefines what human life is, what we see in our government is that it's walking away from God. So we see marriage having the underpinnings pulled out of it in our society. We see our government right now falling away from God, and that leaves one institution, doesn't it? The church. And so this is the day and this is the age where you and I are called on and commissioned to the responsibility to stand up and be counted for God's word and what is right. You and I are called to do that. While the rest of our world is falling apart, you and I are called to be people of God. You and I are called to stand on this word. When all else fails, you and I are to be standing head and shoulders above the rest. Because we're standing on the word and the truth and the promises of God Almighty. As we move on, Genesis chapter 9. God comes to Noah with a covenant. He establishes a covenant with Noah. Look at verse 8. Chapter 9, verse 8. Hear these words of God's word. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you. And with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the field, earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. That means forever. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant. God gives a covenant to Noah. God makes this permanent. He makes it perpetual. And it will stand throughout earth's history. 
he will never again destroy the earth with a flood. Every storm is going to come to an end. And God gives a sign and a seal to that permanent covenant, the rainbow. When we see a rainbow, we should think of this covenant, God's promise, God's peace that comes to the world. Sadly, the rainbow has fallen into the same trap as so many of the other miracles of God. In our society, when people come to Christmas, they think of Santa Claus more than they think about the birth of a Savior. When they come to Easter, they think more about an Easter bunny than they do the resurrection of that Savior to give us life. And when they see a rainbow, they think about a pot of gold or even worse, about its symbolism to the gay movement of our society. But people of God, I want you to remember what the rainbow stands for. It is connected with the flood that it will never again take place. But here's a larger truth that I want you to hear. When God says, I make you a perpetual, permanent promise, a permanent covenant, I will never break my word. And so the covenant of the rainbow stands for a larger truth that we can stand on the promises of God. Every promise is by God's mouth, and every promise will never be broken. We can stake our lives on the word and the power and the promise of God. In the Bible... There are three major rainbows. You might want to write this down. There are three major rainbows in the Bible. Noah saw God's rainbow after the storm in Genesis chapter 9. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 28, the prophet Ezekiel sees a rainbow during a storm. And in Revelation chapter 4, verse 3, John the apostle sees a rainbow before the storm of God's judgment comes. Three principal rainbows, one before, one during, and one after the storm. That's very, very important. And I want you to look at some great words from God's Word. You might want to underline this. I would never thought about it before until I found it in study this week. God revealed it to me. Look at chapter 9, verse 16. Genesis 9, 16. The first few words are these, and the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it. I want you to think of this. Whenever you look at a rainbow, you are looking into the eyes of God. Whenever you see a rainbow, God says in this perpetual covenant, I'm looking at the rainbow. When you and I behold a rainbow, we're looking into the eyes of God. That just makes shivers run over me, that indeed God's eyes are on me. But don't miss this clear message of God's word, God's promises. A rainbow before a storm. There are many of us here today who haven't experienced a storm in our life. You know, just like yesterday, this young couple, man, life is just wonderful. We're getting married, and life is ahead of us, and it's going to be wonderful. Got a honeymoon coming and all those things. Life is good. I am strong. Things are great. No storms. There's a rainbow before that storm. Sometimes we miss thanking God when we're in those good days, but I want you to remember, he's watching you, and he's giving you strength and protection before the storm. And then in the Bible, there is a rainbow during a storm. Perhaps there's someone here today who's in the midst of a storm. Maybe it's a storm of health. Maybe it's a storm in your family. Maybe it's a storm of finances. There's something bringing you anxiety and worry and depression. You're in the storm. There's a rainbow in the Bible that's in the storm. And God's watching. God's taking care of you. God's protecting you in the storm. And then in the Bible, there's a rainbow after a storm. Maybe you've passed through the storm and you're healing right now. God's watching over your healing. And he's taking care of you. Anytime, in any situation of our life, God promises, I will never turn away from you. My eyes are always on you. I'm watching you in love and strength and healing. And we can always trust him in that promise. Praise God. Today, no matter who you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening in your life, God's word assures us that we're under his watchful eye. 
And that is a huge truth for us to depend on today. But I want you to listen. A covenant with God has two sides. God makes a promise, and he asks us to respond to him. God loves you and me. And no matter where we are in life, before the storm, during the storm, or after the storm, he's watching us and taking care of us. But are our eyes on him? There's the essence of covenant. God is giving us his watchful eye. We, in return, keep our eyes on him. Do we have eyes for him? Are we following him? You know, much of the world says, sure, I know God. Sure, I love God. Sure, I come to God when I'm in trouble. Use him kind of like a fire extinguisher. When I need him, I find him. And I ask him to help me. Well, that's not a relationship with God. That's not keeping your eyes on God. That's actually making a mockery of him when you only dig him up when you need him. A relationship is keeping our eyes on him through every day, through every peaceful moment, through every storm, through every healing, to keep our eyes on him and follow him. A relationship is every day. No matter what we're doing, where we are, a relationship is every day. So believers, here's the end of the sermon. How many of us will come to the altar of our heart and perhaps to this physical altar today and say, Lord, help me keep my eyes on you. I know the Bible assures me your eyes are on me through every moment of my life. Help me. Give me strength. Give me wisdom to keep my eyes on you. If these are good days for you, keep your eyes on him. If you're in the middle of a storm, don't take your eyes off him. If you've come out of the storm and you're healing, he's the great physician. Keep your eyes on him. He will heal you through. How many of us today just need to approach the altar and say, Lord, here I am in life. Here's where I am. Help me keep my eyes on you. Help me follow the footsteps of Jesus. The one whose blood ran red so that my sins were washed white. Help me keep my eyes on you. And today, if you are here and you've never come to Jesus Christ as Savior, this is the greatest invitation of the universe, and God allows me the privilege to voice this invitation to you. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart as Savior, God is especially watching you right now. God is watching you with the desire that you will understand how much he loves you He loves you so much that he allowed his very son, Jesus, to go to the cross and his blood to run red on that cross that your sins might be forgiven as white as snow. And God's eyes are on you right now as he desires for you to come to this altar and say, I believe it, Lord. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, that I might be forgiven, that I might be saved. And in this moment of decision, as I invite Jesus into my heart, that I will become your child forever and ever. If you need him this day, he is watching and he is poised and he is ready to forgive and to adopt you as his son or daughter for all eternity when you simply come and say, I believe Jesus' blood ran red that I might be forgiven now. You come. He's watching. He's waiting for you. Church home, whatever the need, praise God. He meets us here. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you that God's word never leaves out one person. If there is one person here today who simply wants to say, Lord, help me keep my eyes on you, I pray that he or she will come to this altar and make that rededication before you now. Whether they're in the great days before any kind of storm comes or whether they're in the midst of a storm of some sort or whether they're after the storm in the healing phase, you're watching. But, Lord, in every phase of our life, help us keep our eyes on you. And if there's one today, Father, who has never received Jesus as Savior, never publicly come, Jesus publicly went to the cross, and I believe that when we accept Jesus as Savior, we need to do it so that all can see that we receive him as our Lord. May that one come today. Jesus' blood ran red that his or her sin could be made white as snow. Church home, whatever the need, meet us here, Lord. Direct us by your hand in Jesus' name. Amen.